Welcome everybody. This is Angela Campbell. Uh, this is actually, even though I'm speaking on technology, this is the first time I've uh, presented in a webinar format. Um, so I'm really interested in how these questions work. So if anyone has questions, please send them to me because apparently they're going to pop up on my screen and I'm excited to, to see that process. So feel free to send the, tr the questions at any time um, during the presentation and I will answer them out loud to everybody so that they can hear them. Now, I litigate. And I have uh, been litigating since 2003. And in approximately 2005, I decided that I needed to start using technology in the courtroom. And that was when I was a federal public defender, when I had a lot of resources that the federal government was paying for. And I figured we might as well uh, use the resources that were available to us. In 2007, when I opened the law firm here in Des Moines, I took that with me and I decided that it, it, it's not just for government attorneys, everyone should be using technology. And the reasons why I think it is important are that juries now expect it. Juries want to see PowerPoint, they want to see evidence up on a screen. Uh, our jurors are getting younger and younger and they want to uh, not only hear testimony but see evidence. Our jurors are learning by television, and that is no different in the, uh, in the jury process during a courtroom uh, trial. Also, our judges expect it. Uh, and if they don't expect it, they appreciate it. Uh, as the courtrooms, it started with all the federal courtrooms, started to become um, technologically savvy, and so you could just plug into the, to the desks and have your presentations presented uh, throughout the the courtroom, but now the county courthouses are all becoming updated uh, with technology. And with e-filing, it becomes easier and easier to use technology for the judges, not just paper formats. Oops, I think I went one too far here. And also, I don't know if, I guess it's not showing that, maybe it's just not showing on my screen, but also, Clients expect it. Um, I can tell you that every time I have any sort of minor technology in a trial, uh, the clients really appreciate it and they really feel like you are doing something for them uh, that some other lawyer may not have done or they may not have seen in prior cases. Now, technology is not just for inside the courtroom. And if you aren't using advanced technology and trial preparation software uh, prior to trial, it'll be very difficult to convert into using the technology in the trial. Uh, unfortunately, this is sort of what my office looks like anyway, even though I use technology. But in theory, you should be able to use technology in a way that your office can look more like this, rather than the stacks and stacks of papers and stacks of exhibits. My first trial I ever did, I had a, a trial notebook with little yellow sticky notes stuck all over it by witness name and fact and date. And now I don't, I don't do any of that. I don't even bring in a trial notebook. I simply bring in a laptop. Uh, usually I bring in two laptops into a trial and my entire file and all of the sticky notes are inside of that laptop. Now these software programs are designed, the ones I'm going to talk about, are designed for attorneys and they're designed by attorneys. And so they mimic to some degree how we were already preparing for trial uh, using sticky notes, using uh, dates, uh, using issues, using um, organization by witness. All of, the, all of the software that is out there uh, is able to do exactly what you already do. Uh, regardless of how you're doing it, the software can do that. Now, social research studies show us that um, juries actually prefer to see the evidence. They prefer to see the, um, you know, what the exhibits are, and they want to see them on the TV screen. Uh, this is a, a chart showing that most people, most humans, which include juries, which include judges, are visual learners. They prefer to see things rather than to simply hear things. And after three days of information, a jury or a judge will remember things that they both heard and saw at a much higher percentage than if they just heard the testimony. So if you're thinking about just using a witness and you, and you just want to have them testify and have the jury hear their information, try to think of a way 
that you can also present that information visually. If you can use the technology during testimony, that's preferable. If not, uh, using technology so that the jurors and the judges can see it uh, either in opening or during closing, uh, if you can't use it during direct or cross, really will increase the chances of your important information uh, being retained by the judges and the jury. That also means that if there's harmful testimony, you may not want them to see it. You may not want to put up uh, you know, visual information or visual exhibits for them during trial if it's something that you are hoping that they won't remember during deliber uh, jury deliberations. But that, those good facts, I think it's very important for us to be using technology to present those, that information to the jury and to the judges, uh, both visually and orally. Now there's three types of software I'm going to talk about today, mainly, and then a couple other ones that uh, you'll have to use an expert for if, if you um, decide you want to, want to use the software. But this is what I use in every trial. I have a case map, which is a type of software that I uh, would I make it, I think of it as the trial notebook. It's the way to organize your facts and your witnesses and your issues, and it's all done before trial, and then you take that information in case map and you bring it into trial with you. Now, trial director, some people think you only need one type of software, and, and currently that's not the case. Um, there are softwares that integrate with each other. Case map and trial director recently made it so that you can integrate the two together. Uh, but it used to be you had to in enter all the information separately. So if you have the older versions, you're still going to have to do them separately. But they are different programs, and they have different purposes. Now, um, trial director is more like what I would say is an ELMO. Anything that you would put an exhibit on, you would put into trial director, an exhibit sticker. So anything you want the jury to see, you put into trial director. And you can prepare that ahead of time. Uh, if you know the exhibit numbers, uh, but you can also you can also do it on the fly during trial. I've, I had one case where we simply did not know what the attorney generals were going to be using uh, for their exhibits, uh, so we uploaded what we thought they might use uh, in, in advance and to put it into trial director. But we also brought in then a scanner uh, into the into the courtroom, and whenever they did an exhibit, we simply scanned it and put it into trial director. And then by the time cross came around, we were able to project that exhibit onto the television screens uh, for the jury. And I think it was very effective because they could see that we weren't trying to hide anything and we, were, we were wanted them to see the exhibit and look at the exhibits. And then PowerPoint, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, um, but sometimes I think people think that they can get away with just using PowerPoint, that PowerPoint can do everything for you. They can, it can do openings and closings and you can use it for your cross-examination and for showing off exhibits. I disagree. PowerPoint is a, is a set number of slides. It is not flexible very easily as you're in trial unless you're very uh, technologically savvy. A trial director is much more flexible in trial and, and you can pull up exhibits and pull down exhibits very quickly and you can pull them out of order and you can add them very simply into the trial director program. PowerPoint, on the other hand, uh, you have prepared in advance, and uh, if you were to use, say, an exhibit in PowerPoint and the judge refused to allow you to admit the exhibit or to display it to the jury, um, if you don't know how to do it right, you may accidentally go ahead and display it because you've already entered it as a slide. Trial director takes away that, uh, that possibility. But PowerPoint is very useful during openings and closings. Um, and in fact, when you're using trial director during trial, there's a process by which you can take screen grabs of what you're doing with the exhibits and what's happening during the trial that it saves and you can automatically just upload it into PowerPoint as a slide for your closing argument. And so I would recommend at least these three types of software in your practice if you're planning on litigating and using technology. There are other uh, versions and other types of software, Sanction, for example, um, that you can use instead of these three. But these are the three that I use and the three that I find to be the simplest. Now, I want to start with Case Map. Now, remember, Case Map is the one that we're, we're using to prepare our trial ahead of time. So you're using it to organize facts and using it to organize issues. And you're doing that well in advance of trial. I use Case Map for cases that aren't going to trial. 
Um, I use it for sentencing. I use it to organize uh, when I've taken depositions, to organize the depositions. Um, and I use it to, to do timelines. It's a very useful software to create timelines. Um, the best time to use it, in my experience, is you do all the preparation pre-trial, and then you're using case map on cross and direct. Uh, it's very easy to run searches within case map and searches within your facts on case map uh, during trial, and then you present um, the information in trial on trial director during trial. Now, it is a little bit expensive. Um, it's a, I just looked it up today. It looks like it's $407 for the first user. For those of you who are, if you are a criminal justice act, so a federal court appointed attorney, you can get discounted rates. The best thing about these softwares that, that both CaseMap and Trial Director that I find is that they have elaborate online training. You can actually go to the website. They have webinars. They have free webinars uh, to train you. Everything you need to know, you can learn within um, the actual software. For those of you, again, who are federal uh, criminal defense attorneys, there is a free seminar on how to use case map that's held twice a year uh, throughout the country. But you don't, you don't need to go to a, a seminar. You can learn everything online. In fact, I taught myself case map uh, before the first time I used it. This is a, <clears throat> a picture of a screenshot of what it looks like once you have case map set up. Uh, and you'll see that there's on the left side, you'll see that you're organizing things by facts, by person, by document, and by issue. And, and there are different ways to do it, and different people handle things in different manners when they're litigating. I personally always set up my case map so that my issues match the counts if it's a criminal case, or the elements if it's a civil case, the, what the elements of each um, count is in the civil case. In this particular case, you'll see this, those of you familiar with this case, this was uh, the case that I did that wound up in the US Supreme Court. And the reason why it was, I bring this case up as an example is that you never know how long these cases are going to take. And once you've done the work in case map, you never really have to do it again. Uh, it, it already saves your issues, it saves your facts, it saves your screenshots during trial, it saves um, all of your witnesses and what they testify to, it's all already uploaded for easy review um, before trial. Now this particular sheet that I'm showing you is the issues sheet. So it's how I set up the trial ahead of time for the issues that I thought were important. And oops, you'll see on the, the right side there the number of facts and a little, so I've, when I did this screenshot, I had count one highlighted, and you'll see number of facts, 17. If I clicked on that uh, within, so, within case map, it would tell me everything about that particular um, issue, every fact that I had linked to that issue. And the reason that's useful is for you civil litigators, if you do this ahead of time, you can start to see when you're reviewing documents and you're getting through your discovery, you're, you can start to see what elements you already have facts on uh, for your summary judgment motions. And in fact, there's a summary judgment um, wizard within, within case map that helps create your disputed versus undisputed facts um, that you have to file with every summary judgment motion. And so this makes it very easy. Once you've reviewed a document and once you've identified the facts within that document, you never have to go back and review that document again. You don't have to re-review it for trial, you simply have to review your case map, issues, and facts spreadsheet. Now this is an example um, here of the documents sheet. And so this is all of the documents that you have identified within case map. Now the way case map works, for those of you who haven't used it, is that it is, you, you don't necessarily upload documents into case map, even though it, it seems like that's what you're doing. What you actually do is you link the documents to the software. And so your documents are still being stored in their original location on your hard drive um, so that then when you click on, if you look at those little paper clips on the left uh, column, um, the sort of at the left side of that circle, if you clicked on that paper clip, it would actually pull up 
the portion of the document where that fact came from. It'll be highlighted and it'll take you exactly to that document. Uh, that's really useful during trial when your witness suddenly says something different than what they said during their deposition. You don't have to pull out the deposition and find it. You simply have to pull up, up that fact, click on that, that um, little paper clip, and automatically it'll take you to the page and line of where that fact came from. Um, this is an especially useful tool when you have a multi-week trial and there's no way you can possibly remember you know, when and where people said various different things. Uh, what I've started doing, and I haven't even gotten any objections yet, <laughs> which is somewhat surprising, is that I don't even necessarily have, I might have one paper copy of everything somewhere just in case something malfunctions, um, but I'll have two computers. I'll have the one that I'm running trial director on and I'll have the one that I'm running case map on. And if a witness says something different, I'll simply click on that paper clip. It'll be on a little, a little netbook. It'll pull it up and I'll walk up and hand the computer to the witness and say, this is page eight of your deposition and on that day didn't you say this? And it's very rare for a witness to say, no, that's, you know, that's not what I said, that's not my deposition, you know, what are you showing me? You know, they don't do that because they realize that yes, they have said it. If they were to do that, I think a jury would get really irritated with them because then what you do is you walk back over, you pull out the hard copy of the deposition that you have stored in the back of the courtroom that you haven't had to use yet, it takes five, ten minutes, and then you walk up with the real deposition and show them, and it'll say the exact same thing. Uh, and then the jury will, um, I think the jury will side with the lawyer on that, that sh showing that you're trying to be efficient with time, uh, but it's the witness that's causing the problems. So then you've got on here also with case map, um, Adobe Acrobat, which I don't necessarily talk about that much during this presentation, but which I think uh, every lawyer needs to have now um, with electronic filing. Even if you think you have a, you know, a different PDF maker or, or something, Adobe itself is a very powerful tool and a very powerful software. And in fact, what they're doing in CaseMap is pulling off of the programming within Adobe. So once you load CaseMap, and this is an, this is an older version of CaseMap that's showing the picture here, but it, it's, it's similar in the newest CaseMap version, is it actually doesn't add in in with Adobe Acrobat. And so as you're reviewing documents, you'll have this case map button, no matter if you have case map open or not, that case map button is there. And so when you rev you're reviewing discovery electronically, you can automatically send facts into case map from Adobe. So for example, this is a, um, you know, a PDF in Adobe and it has to be optimized. So you have to have character recognition. Uh, so you can run that in the, the more advanced versions of Adobe. You can run character recognition so that it can read the words. And then when you highlight it, um, you could then right click and it gives you an option to send it to case map. So as you're reviewing a document, you'll pull up, it'll show you this send to case map feature. Um, it'll automatically have typed out this question and answer so that your text is already there. That's now your fact text if you want. Now you can, al you can also change it and type in your own. You'll see underneath there, fact text. Uh, you can add dates and times, you, you link it to an issue and you send it to case map. And then that fact has been automatically uploaded into case map and it has linked to that point of the transcript with that fact and that date. Um, and if you have typed in a witness's name in your, in your fact text section, it will automatically link to that witness so that when your witness is testifying, you later can pull it up uh, if they say something different. So here is an example of, you see, barrage distributed to Brown was my issue, 1.1 under count one. Um, barrage distri distributed to Brown, three facts, and if you see, if I click on those three facts, which I've done in the screenshot, you'll see below, it tells me what three facts uh, are linked to that sub-issue. And each of those facts, actually, you'll see that it has a paper clip to the left of it, and that means that if um, I have a question about where that fact is coming from, it tells me the source on the right, but also if I hit that paper clip, it takes me directly to that page and that line with that fact that, that was um, identified there. Now you'll see also 
the underlines there under certain names. Jamie Miller, for example, has underlined. Marcus Braz has underlined. Those are people that I have uploaded into Case Map, and I can run these same questions, uh, these same searches on the people, and then it'll pull me pull up all facts that are related to that person. So you see here the three facts matches the three facts. None of you have sent me questions yet, just pointing that out. Um, and so here what you're also seeing is the, the paperclip. That's where that arrow is down there at the bottom. That paperclip is linking to your document. So now this is the time, this is one, like I said, when you can link it in case map to the actual witness. So Tammy Norgon um, was the wife of, of Mr. Barrage, and so she was a witness in the case, or not a wife of Mr. Barrage, a wife of the victim in the case. Um, and she had testified against Mr. Barrage, and so she was a major witness, as you can see, and I have 48 facts linked to Tammy Norgon. And so during trial, if, you know, I had this one case where they told me that I had, there's a possibility of 70 witnesses, and they wouldn't tell me what order they were calling them in. Uh, that's a nightmare to prepare for, unless you have case map. Because it didn't matter what order they called them in. All I had to do was open case map. They said, we now call Tammy Norgon. It wasn't in this case. They told me what order in this case. But, for example, um, we're calling Tammy Norgon. I open case map. I go to the person spreadsheet. I hit that little three dots by the 48, and it pulls up every fact about Tammy Norgon automatically. It takes about 10 seconds. So it backfired on them. They, it didn't help them at all that they didn't tell me what order they were being called on. Now, you don't have to do it on the fly if you are someone who is a chronic overpreparer like myself. Um, there is a, a way within case map that you can create these reports where it actually, I say this exact same thing, only I say send it to a report. And it automatically fills in all of these things for me. It gives the date that I authored it, what the, you know, the 48 facts, the witness's name, the case name. I didn't enter any of that. The, the software did that. This report took me, I would say, 30 seconds to generate. And then it has a spreadsheet of all the facts by date and their source that I can print out and give to a client. And the client thinks you are a genius and that you created this entire document. Of course, you didn't. Case map did. And so you can see that has, that's what's coming up in the report. That's also the same thing that will come up if you're simply within, in the program during trial and you click on the three little dots. It'll pull up these same facts in date order, um, and, you, and you go through them. You can also do this by issue. So this is this Philip Hawkins case is actually the one that comes as a sample case when you buy case maps, so you can play around with it, and it has all the data entered. So you can that's how they do their their webinars. You learn how to do things with this fake case, but this is running a case map facts by issue report. So it gives you all the issues and where the facts are. Uh, this is helpful for closing arguments. When you're talking about elements, you'll have already linked all of your issues. You know, During trial, the most important thing is by witness. You want to make sure you get all your facts into evidence. Um, but it's also important during closing to have all of your uh, facts linked to your issues. So this, again, takes about 30 seconds within the software. And you have them by issue. It's also useful during summary judgment motions or or you know, motions to dismiss or something where there's missing facts for elements um, that you can easily identify by using the software. Now, another thing that it does is it, you know, you've made your facts and you've added dates to the facts, and you can easily make um, chronologies or timelines. This is very helpful to be able to do this, especially in a trial setting where you know, you close. You know, you have your last witness, and you close the next day, and you really don't have time necessarily to to spend on all of these different issues. You can, you know, making timelines, making a, an effective uh, closing argument on PowerPoint. You can actually do this within case map from facts you've already generated. You can add facts as you're going along from trial testimony, and they can be added into case map and then added into this, these chronologies, these timelines, uh, very easily. And so this is a sample of the chronology. Um, that you can use. Hey, I have a question. Is case map a one-time fee or yearly? Uh, there are different versions, um, different ways you can do it. It is a one-time fee initially, and then uh, if you have updates, 
if you want to get the updated version, you you have to pay an update fee. Uh, but it to my at least the one I have, the last time I bought it, it was just a one-time fee. Unlike Trial Director, where you pay a, a yearly fee. Thank you for sending a question. Um, so then we've got here. Uh, so that, that's my, the end I have for case map. Now another thing with case map, and I have up here forensic phone reports as a, an example. A lot of times you, you can link anything. You can link deposition transcripts. You can link police reports. You can link uh, anything that's PDF or JPEG. They've made it now where you can link um, video and audio files. Um, you, can, you can basically, if you're going to use it, you can link it into case map. Um, you know, sometimes you have exhibits in there that aren't admissible. You can use, you know, police reports or forensic reports within case map to have your facts within there because you're not actually ever going to use them or admit them into trial. It, it's a trial preparation and trial use software. Um, what I will say is ab about forensic phone reports is for those of you, and I've put it in here now because I think it's something you do ahead of time before trial, before we get into the trial director. Um, there are so there's so many versions and so many ways that you can can handle cell phone data. And if you ever get the lucky fortune of having having a download, and this is more likely probably in a criminal case than in a civil case, but you can always request it, I think, in a civil case and see if they'll let you do it. If you can do a, a dump of a cell phone and you do a Celebrate um, dump and you do it correctly, you can pull up everything that that phone number has ever done. It includes text messages, deleted text messages, Deleted text messages from before the phone was even used, even if they had an older phone. Um, basically, if the data existed, it's possible, not always, but it's possible that a forensic expert can pull up information. I have a case currently uh, where the lady has had the phone for two years, and I'm pulling up text messages that are six years old uh, from my, fr my phone report. So it's from prior phones. Uh, it's saving all the data. And that's because everyone uploads everything into iCloud. Um, or into the cloud somehow, and then you sync it to your phone because you don't want to lose the text messages you have on your phone. And what you don't realize is you're sending everything. <laughs> you're sending your GPS data, you're sending your deleted data, everything is going with you to your new phone. So it, it only, if it's deleted, will disappear if it gets overwritten uh, by new data. And so you can pull up on a forensic phone report anything, basically, where the person was. If someone has their cell phone on, you can most likely, if you get a dump from their phone, tell exactly where they were at any one particular time. Um, this can be very useful, again, in criminal cases, e either for the state um, or for the federal government if they're trying to prove that your person was at the scene of the crime, or if you have an alibi or you actually weren't the person that committed the crime or you, want, you, know, you were somewhere else. Um, this can be very useful. Anytime that your location is important, even if you're not sending data at that time, you're not making a call, you're not texting, the advanced phones are keeping track of where you are because you, most of us have it set to download data every 15 minutes. And it's doing that using um, either a cell tower or a wireless network. And your phone stores that information forever. It's scary, so don't let police take your phone. Here's an example of an extraction report from a phone that I got. I, I whited it out because it's, um, it's still a case that I, I, that's active, I guess, in a way. So here's a, a forensic report where I said, hey, can you just give me all the text messages that this, this person deleted? Because I think that's the kind of stuff I'd want to know. And so uh, the witness had testified in a deposition that she did not delete anything from her phone. Well, that seemed unlikely. So we got the phone dump, and uh, it actually showed that she had deleted a whole bunch of stuff including on the day of the alleged crime. Um, material stuff, uh, stuff talking about the defendant, uh, lots of things that were deleted, not simply, um, not, not just, you know, oh, I forgot I deleted those. So I was able to run everything that had ever been deleted off of her phone, and I got a report. Now, for those of you who have an iPhone and you have it sitting there, I want to show you something with it. If you will pull out your iPhone, and I actually did this with a, uh, with a group of college students who all panicked when I did it. And I saw them mad madly like deleting everything off their phone. So if you go into settings, 
and then privacy, and then location services, and then system services. If you go all the way down to the bottom of system services, you'll see, um, you'll see frequent locations, and then you go down to frequent locations, at the bottom of frequent locations, you'll see history. And for example, if I do mine, and I haven't turned mine off because I actually have decided that I'd rather have an alibi for when I get falsely accused of a crime, uh, and so I'll just know not to take my phone with me if I'm going to actually commit a crime. So if you go, you know, so your settings and then you're at privacy, location services, if you have it turned on, and then you go all the way down to the bottom, system services, frequent locations. I can tell by looking at mine that I was in Ainsworth, Nebraska, my parents' house, and it actually highlights my parents' address and tells me that I was there um, on 6.27 of 15 from 2.24 p.m. to 7.05 p.m. when I went to the bar at 7.05 p.m. And then I returned to home at 2.30 a.m. until 10.17 a.m. And that's getting that all from, I'm not on a wireless network, it's getting that from my GPS data because I have activated frequent locations on all these different things on my phone. Uh, and so if someone had my phone, they could tell you within 30 seconds where I had been in the last 30 days by date and time. Um, that's just from looking at the phone. Now you take that times a thousand and you have a forensic cell phone person take a look and they can tell you where that phone has been and at what time and um, for how long and what it was doing. It can tell you when it's uploading pictures to to Facebook. It can tell you when it's downloading. It can tell you, it can tell you everything you would ever want to know about a phone. So if you have a case where there's any question about phone records, you need to have one of these forensic guys uh, take a report, do a report. And then they send you the report in a, in a fancy you know, PDF that you upload into CaseMap and you link it by date and time, and you know exactly where everybody was at every time uh, during trial. Do you have any questions like, I thought maybe one of you would say, how do I delete all of this information off my phone? But no one's asked that yet. So um, the answer is you burn the phone. OK. The next software that we're talking about is Trial Director. Now remember, Trial Director is the, the software that I use to display exhibits at trial. Um, so it's anything that you're going to actually present to a jury. It replaces the Elmo. You've preloaded your exhibits and you're going to display them at trial. Uh, I find that the best use for trial director is cross-examination or direct examination when you're when you have any sort of exhibit you're going to use during that time and then also I use it to prepare for closing so you can upload you know sometimes even if I uh, haven't used it if I you know you can upload different things into case into trial director and then take screenshots and they look fancy for your for your PowerPoint. This one's more expensive, and this is the one where it has a yearly cost. Uh, last I checked, I, I checked it today, and it, it said this price still. I know a lot of them have been changing around their prices, and uh, Adobe, for example, is now a subscription rather than buying the actual software, and so things are, you know, sort of in flux on price. But uh, again, it's it's a little bit pricey. But if you think about what it would cost um, to you know, in time to prepare these exhibits in a physical manner and then to display them to the jury. I, I think it's well worth it. And then, th again, there's free training online. It's very easy. Trial Director is very easy to use, especially just, you know, the simple way. I use Trial Director very simply. I don't do a lot of the elaborate things you can do with it. Uh, but you can splice videos. You can, um, you know, create clips from videos and from audio files. You can do real-time transcripts where that, you know, they they read along with you, and they you so you can play stuff to the jury while it's showing um, along on the screen what's being said. All those things are available in Trial Director, but I use it just to 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 to, to use exhibits. Uh, and again, if you're a federal court-appointed criminal attorney, there's free training uh, through the uh, Defender Services branch. So this is a screenshot of one that I actually did in trial, and you know it's really hard to use. Phone, things like phone records and emails effectively in trial without a software, without any sort of technology. And so this is a phone report where it was important that this witness had called this certain number, this certain time, and how long they talked. And so what you do is you, you can 
you actually show the exhibit, a hard copy exhibit, to the witness um, in an exhibit book usually, and then you ask for permission to publish. You publish the first page, and then you ask the witness to find this certain entry. And it, of course, will take them longer than it will for you to hit your button that zooms it out. So the jury already knows the answer before the witness knows the answer. And, it's, it, and so they find it, and then the jury already knows that they've talked for 50 minutes to this number on this date. Uh, but then the witness will answer it uh, and verify that your phone record uh, is accurate, and that's, that's when they talked. Um, and you can highlight, and you can blow up these boxes, and you can do all these things. So it's very effective for things where, you know, it's really hard to use phone records effectively unless the jury can see them. They want to see the phone call, okay? This is one that I did as an example of a closing argument. It, you know, I didn't do this during trial. I did it after trial, and the witnesses had all said that they didn't talk to each other. And so, you know, at, at closing, you can comment on the evidence. And my comment on the evidence was, look, you have the 7,000 pages of phone records. I've just pulled them out for you. You can go back and verify this if you want to. But I've highlighted, you know, this witness is, um, you know, the witness that you're seeing is witness orange. And these are the times that she testified she didn't talk to these other witnesses. And here are, you know, red is witness B, yellow is witness C, green is witness D, blue is witness E. And you can see here that she's, she's just not telling you the truth. Your phone records show you that she talked to all these witnesses in all these different days. So that's an example of um, how you can use trial director for your closing argument, even if you don't actually do this during trial, this, exa this exact exhibit. It takes a little bit of time. What you can also see here is that you can do side-by-side -side comparisons of, of documents. I had one recently where the question was whether I had a handwriting expert and so I would put up the question handwriting, the question handwriting sample on the left, and you can see here I've done four different ones on the four different screens. So you can divide it by quarters or by half to compare signatures is what I was doing. So on half was one signature, the question signature on the other half was the known signature, and then the, the witness could actually walk through and the jury's following along, looking at the two signatures on the screen uh, as you're talking about them. And so they don't have to just hear the expert, they can actually look and see that the signatures are in fact different, and it's not the same person signing them. Um, and it, you know, it was overkill to some degree, but then there was there was so much, it was there was so little question about the fact. I mean, really, it's a fact question, right? It's a fact question of whether or not they're matching signatures. After our te our expert testified, um, it was a criminal case. They dropped that count. They said, no, it would be silly of us to continue. And I think that's solely because of this particular uh, software. It could you could actually see blown up that the signatures didn't match. So this is another example here of, um, of what you can do in trial director for bank records. So you know you get the bank records admitted and then you blow them up uh, and you can you can blow up multiple boxes at once and show transactions that you think were important uh, during the you know within the bank statement. And so you're still offering you're still offering the exhibits in paper. Um, you're still having them admitted, and then you're still getting permission to publish, and then you can enter the exhibit number, and it pops it up in Trial Director, and you can blow, then you can manipulate it while you're doing it. And then all it takes, if there's some sort of problem, you just hit Escape, and the whole thing goes away, and you can bring it up again by just typing in the exhibit number once the admission question gets resolved. Okay. The next one is PowerPoint. Now, I think most of us know PowerPoint. Um, it's, you know, we've been using it for a long time. People use it not just in trials. Uh, it's for anything where you're doing advanced preparation. So I don't use this on the fly. I would never use PowerPoint, on, you know, to do a cross or even a direct because you don't know for sure what's going to happen. Um, but you would use it for openings, closings, or even arguments. You know, set, I use it a lot of times for sentencing arguments um, with judges if I have a contested sentencing. It comes with Microsoft Office. That's approximately what it costs. It flux fluctuates as well. Um, again, there's some, it'll, for those of you who have had PowerPoint and think you know it, uh, it does so many more things than you even realize. It's a very powerful software as well. And there are online trainings, again, on how to use PowerPoint more effectively and how to do fancy things with PowerPoint. Now, Social research has shown 
that it is most effective to present continuously, both orally and in, in visually. A lot of times, I think, in trial or during closing or openings, we go back and forth, and we just we either do a bullet points all the time for our, you know, we have an outline and we use it as our notes and the jury's reading our notes, but we're also using the notes so that we know what we're going to say. Um, the research study shows that what you want instead of bullet points is you want continuous both visual and oral presentations that are slightly different. So you don't want to just repeat yourself in writing on, in bullet points. What you want are slides and evidence and demonstrations consistently throughout opening and direct and cross uh, that reinforce your points throughout the trial. And then you end in closing. And you don't just have this time where you're talking and you just show a couple of things. You have a presentation uh, that is both. And so the studies show that that is by far the jury's preference. And if a jury likes you and likes your presentation, they're more likely to like your client. The other fun thing that, that, um, that PowerPoint does, and you have to be linked to the web, but now all of our courtrooms are, is that you actually can, you can pull up things and you can link actual websites in here and it auto pulls it up. Um, this is actually my favorite. I don't know, will they hear this if it starts playing? Okay. Um, this is my favorite. Uh, Favorite YouTube it has nothing to do with technology, but it shows you you can auto link. So for those of you who used to embed videos into your PowerPoint, you don't have to do that anymore. You can just link it somewhere online, and then you can play it from within your PowerPoint. I don't know, it still makes me laugh. That's why I chose this one. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen it, but. So it makes you look really technologically savvy, but all I did was I cut and pasted that link into my PowerPoint. I just hit right click, copy, paste, and it auto links into web. You have to be on the web when you're doing your presentation, but it will automatically do it. Um, now I go back to here, and you're back. And all it took was, cl was clicks. You don't actually have to be savvy in order to do it, and you're back into your presentation. Now you can still embed it, and you can embed pictures and embed videos and all those things, uh, but They've made it w really easy to uh, present information in, in an effective manner. So some other tips that I, some tips that I have for you, and then we'll, we'll have questions if anyone has any questions, is um, first off, you need to back up everything. And I know for those of you who have a server, and it's automatically being backed up, but for, for individuals, so if you have a solo practice or you even have a partner and you're, doing a share file, you can never back up enough. And case map and trial director, or case map especially, has automatic backup features where you just click a button and it does it all for you. Uh, and, things, uh, and things can get corrupted. The more advanced your technology and the more you're using you know, different types of both PowerPoint and Adobe and you're changing computers, you know, the more likely you're going to have some problem and you can't even predict what it's going to be that will cause a problem. Um, so I just can't say enough that you need to back up everything. Um, you need to have a copy of all of your case files. You need to have a copy of all of your trial presentations. And you need to have, at trial, a backup plan. Um, that means that you, if technology fails, um, you have a, another laptop that has everything loaded on it, or you have a printed copy, or you have a flash drive that has all the files on it. You have some other sort of backup plan um, because you know, especially as these courthouses are new to technology and new to their systems, um, you really want to have some way to, uh, to have a, another way you can proceed on if your technology fails. You're using technology to supplement and reinforce what you're talking about. You're not relying on technology to present the information completely. You know, we're not going to just have a PowerPoint where you 
type out your points and you have them read them and you read them out loud to them. You, what you really want to do is you want to have a um, use technology to supplement and reinforce exactly what you're saying. Okay. Don't just read and repeat like I'm doing. Don't do this. Don't do it like this. This slide's a horrible slide. I've told you to back up. Did you need to read that you backed up? Did you need to read, supplement, and reinforce? Don't do bullet points. Don't, don't do this slide. Don't say, here are the elements and here are the three bullet points. They know what you're talking about. They, and you want to supplement what you're saying with your slide. You don't want to have your slide be the information and be the closing. Uh, and you don't want to just simply present information in written form. You want to have it both orally and then supplemented with technology. Graphics are very important. Jury trials, while exciting to us, are boring to juries and they're boring to judges and they will fall asleep and they will miss things and if they don't like you and they like the other side, they, they may just vote against you. And if you use graphics and you use video and you use audio and you show that you know how to use it and that you're trying to be efficient with their time and effective with the use of their technology, the jury's going to give you more credit. Know your limitations as well. So if you are, have never done a trial before with technology, don't come in with case map and trial director on two laptops that you just bought yesterday and think you're going to be able to do it. Practice it. Uh, you know, try it with a hearing first. Use it, use it on a motion to suppress hearing or a sentencing hearing. Or you know, try a, do a little mock trial in your office and see, do a sample cross-examination using trial director and see how it works and know whether or not you're able to do it yourself. It is difficult sometimes to use trial director effectively and PowerPoint effectively if you're the only lawyer and the only person in the courtroom other than the client. You do not want to have your client being the one that's running the t technology or the one that helps you necessarily. Um, and you don't want to rely on opposing counsel to bail you out. You need to know what you're able to do and have done it before and then be able to go in and use what you know and feel comfortable with. Start with one of them. If you've never used any technology, start with a PowerPoint um, on your closing and practice it and talk to another lawyer that has used it and go into the courtroom and, and make sure it works ahead of time um, and, and try it out and know whether or not it's going to work. And what I've done before, and I think that I'm pretty savvy on these, I teach at the national seminars on case map and trial director, if I get into a complicated case, I'm not coming in by myself and running trial director and case map. If it's complicated and it has more than about 10 to 15 documents, I have someone else there. It's either going to be an assistant or another lawyer, or if it's in the film tax credit trials, I actually brought in a software person um, from out of state to run everything uh, because we had, you know, hundreds of thousands of documents all loaded and we had corruption problems and we, you know, lost versions of the case map file and all these things that I, you know, your focus as the lead litigator is to be the person that's speaking to the jury and operating things from a, a big picture and have someone else there. Uh, you'd be surprised at how cheap you, cheaply you can get someone to do that and knows what they're doing um, to run it with you and know if you need to do that. For those of you who are young attorneys, learn the software so that you can be that person. Um, so that you're the person that's, that the partner chooses to come into trial with them. If you know how to do case map and you say, hey, look, I've learned the software and look what it can do and I can do this for you in your trial or in your summary judgment hearing, uh, they're going to, you're going to get a better opportunity to come into a courtroom and show that partner or your boss or whoever you're working with that you know what you're doing and you'll be more likely to come into a courtroom. I can't say enough that you have to practice it. Um, it's not enough to do the trainings and to, and to just think you now know how to do it. You have to practice what you're actually going to do. And if you can, practice it with a witness. If you have a direct witness and you're going to use one or two exhibits, just tell them, I have this new software and I want to practice your uh, direct testimony with this software. And they'll come in and you can, you can actually use it. Now, most of the courtrooms have uh, projectors now. It used to be that when you use these softwares and want to do trial director, I drive around with a projector and a screen, and I still drive around with it, but I haven't had to use it in quite a bit of um, time because most of the courtrooms have a projector already hooked up or they have a screen already set up, and they're anticipating 
that you're going to use technology. Uh, that means you need to go in and test your technology that it matches their technology. And the other thing that I'll tell you that's not on here that I found though is that know what sort of connection you need to a projector. If it's, if it's going to be a projector itself rather than something at your desk, go and find out what cord you need well before trial and go buy a really long one because uh, you never know where that projector is going to be set up or where your um, computer is going to be set up. And I violated my own advice this last trial and I ended up tripping over the cord because uh, I didn't have it quite long enough and it was you know, three inches off the ground. And, um, and so it's just something that you know what technology you need and what cords you need uh, so that you can be better prepared for trial. Okay, that's what I have for everybody. Do we have any other questions? Is there? I can only see the one. Um, if attorneys don't have trial director or case map, what are the courts in Iowa, federal and state, using for publishing electronic exhibits and jury? Um, so the question, could they hear you when you talked? No. Okay, so they couldn't hear you. So the question was, if um, if the attorney doesn't have case map or trial director, what are courts using to project electronic exhibits to the jury? They're not. That's the whole point. The, the court's not going to do it for you. If it's um, whoever the exhibit is, uh, if you're the one offering the exhibit, you have to be able to yourself be able to publish it. Uh, I've had cases where the county attorney will have offered, you know, some sort of video, and they have no way, and they haven't prepared or how to play it at all. Um, and the court isn't there to help you do your own trial. They're just there to run everything. And so you have to be prepared to do it yourself. Now, can you do these things without buying case map and trial director? Sure. You can do electronic exhibits and just have a flash drive with them on and open them, you know, name them and have them in PDF and open them and display them. Um, you have to be a little bit careful because, you know, the jury, if you, once you hook up, then the jury can see what you're doing and they can see your screen and they can see what exhibits you have in there and they can see what's on your desktop and all these things. And if you have trial director open and you're running trial director, they don't see all your list of exhibits. You're not double clicking, you know, and clicking the wrong one. You're just typing in the exhibit number and pulling it up. So there are distinct advantages to having trial director, but there is nothing within the case that I'm aware of in any of the courts that actually allow for the court to do it for you. Um, so you're, you're going to want to have that. Now, I think most of the courts are still wanting, even though we're doing electronic filing now and you're doing proposed exhibits electronically, they're still going to want paper files usually uh, for the witnesses. If it's an exhibit that the witness is going to identify and it's a piece of paper, most likely you're still going to want to have a piece of paper for the jury to identify or for the witness to identify and then that paper would go back with the jury. Um, but you know, they're not really going to look at your phone records. No juror goes through the actual phone records and matches up the numbers or anything. So um, I, my advice for you is to, to actually use the software. Any other questions? What is this thing that flashes then? Oh, there, okay. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, if you guys end up getting into a case where you have electronic data and you want to do, you know, some sort of electronic presentation, uh, let me know. We're more than willing to help uh, show you how to do it or give you a, a resource for someone that would know how to do it or would be able to help you in trial. Um, please actually try to use it. I mean, we, I think it's most effective. Uh, let me see. Here's another question. Have you ever been denied using this kind of technology in a courtroom? No. Um, I haven't been, which I've heard that people have, have had that happen. Um, I personally have never, but usually I'm going in ahead of time and I'm telling the judge what I have and I'm showing them what I have and I'm showing the other side what I have and I'm allowing them access to what I have. And so there's, there's really no question. And now that we have electronic filing, the, I think once a judge has an attorney that knows how to use technology in their courtroom, they're going to let the next attorney do it. And so really it's about educating the judge on, on what to do. Now, if you have a judge denying you to use technology, um, I would, you know, maybe if it's a judge that you're wondering it, ask it in a motion and limiting or bring it up ahead of time to see if there's a problem. And then we can get you some affidavits or something um, as to why technology is important and what 
you know, why the judge should allow the technology and what types of technology. I think, a, a, you know, a client has the right to use technology in a courtroom. This is a technological age and technology is important. And so you can't be forced to using paper when we don't use paper really for anything else. All right, well, no more questions. Thank you for participating and please uh, email me or call me if you have any other questions. All right, thank you.